Good morning. This is the first lecture for virology section. And I'm going to talk about viral classification, structure, and replication. And as you can see, viruses come in different shapes and forms, in the, like very symmetrical, and most of them circular, and some of them may have capsules, some of them may not have capsules. Normally in our day-to-day -day life, we these days talk about uh, viral emails, for example, you can see in this slide that there is a viral email, a person sends an email to another person and it spreads out. And then we also talk about uh, virus getting into my flash drive, virus getting into my computer and so on and so forth. And there are many programs uh, which are sold as a part of computer technology in terms of antivirus programs. So the idea behind that is in this kind of viruses is, is it a real virus or is just a something that a computer language where people talk about something being spread so widely that it's out of control and the latter part is true because this is a wild spread uncontrolled spread a phenomenal spread so to speak and it has to be controlled so that's pretty much an upshot of viral infections anyway we need to keep in mind the way we deal with viruses that they are very infectious so to speak so in today's lecture we will talk about definitions and properties of viruses We'll also learn about what are the basis of classification of viruses and how do we name viruses. We'll describe the structure of virion and we'll also finally want to know what are the steps of viral replication. How does the viral virus divide because we need to control that. Let me give you a very precise and uh, very succinct kind of definition for a virus and uh, as one of the person said it is a piece of bad news it's a piece of bad news wrapped in a protein code and then many a time this is what is a true fact about a virus it is a bad news and it comes up wrapped in a protein code and you know for sure based upon your knowledge of immunology that how does our immune system seize the protein and most of the time all uh, severe form of allergies, severe form of reactions and presentations for both MSC class 1 and class 2. They are all proteins. Now, some of the basic definitions and properties of viruses. Uh, viruses are filterable agents. Uh, this means that the size is very small. They can pass through most of the filters that we normally use which are defined to retain bacteria. So if you want to use a filter to make a solution, for example, free of bacteria, you can do so, but viruses will filter through those seeps. The other important thing we have to understand is that viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. What it means is that they're totally, totally dependent on the host cell for replication. So they basically are going to survive on the expense of their host. Virus cannot uh, independently make their own energy or provide for their own metabolism, so to speak. They have to be a part of a host cell to look for those opportunities that would give them the uh, energy and the, the survival. Most of the viral genomes are RNA or DNA, but my slide shows not both. And I do remember I updated that because there is a virus they are talking about these days. Probably it hasn't made its way into our textbook that it has. It may have both RNA and DNA. For all practical purposes and for intensive purposes that we are going to discuss today, I do want you to know that we have to divide viruses into RNA or DNA viruses. Now, viruses uh, have a naked capsid or an envelope morphology. So 
as I said earlier, a piece of bad news in terms of genes, RNA or DNA wrapped up in a protein. So there's a wrap there. Viral components are assembled. So what it means is that different portions of viruses are manufactured within the cell and then the at different places in cytoplasm, in different parts of organelles, and then in nucleus, and then put together. So it's like a scaffolding put together, held together. And they do not replicate as we have this binary fission where one bacteria divides into two and two, and so they kind of have a doubling time. So we don't have that doubling time, so to speak, in this case. So products are made and they are assembled and put together. And virion basically means entire virus particle. Viral assembly usually causes cell death or leave the cell metabolically dysfunction. So once it starts dividing within a cell exponentially and in the process they bud off, that's one process, they would bud off. The other process is that they are going to be out of control and lyse the cell and of course the cell will die. The other consequences of viral properties is that there was a time we used to debate whether viruses are living thing or not living thing and uh, they are just are they just particles or there's some, some crystals and so on so, so to speak but now we um, kind of agree that uh, they are living at the expense of host and they are very infectious and this is how they have survived in nature. And what normally happens is that they basically bring their components. So they they have a, a code, so to speak, where they bring in their own messenger RNA or some of the proteins or some of the identical copies of protein before they would enter a host cell and start multiplying and start dividing. And uh, they have to uh, bring in all those codes that are required and even they may not be provided by the cell, but obviously the, our human cells should not have and should not provide them an opportunity to divide and cause the lysis of their own cells. So viruses then they bring in their own machinery to dismantle our cells. And finally, viral components must self-assemble. So all different parts of the viruses, if they're not assembled, obviously they're not good. So they have to assemble and form a virion, a structure, before they will go and cause further damage. As far as classification and naming of viruses is concerned, uh, there are different classifications in the textbook. Some of them divide them according to their size, morphology, the nucleic acid, RNA or DNA, which we will use in this uh, part of the course as well. And you also have to pay attention to the word that we normally use. For example, you can see uh, coronavirus. So pico means small and RNA is already there and it's a virus. Toga virus. Toga, Greek term for the outer covering, like a cloth or cloak that virus fears outside, and it's a toga virus. And then there are classification based upon the biochemical characteristics, the way their structure is, and how do they divide. So this basically, uh, the mode of replication remains as the current means of taxonomic, cla taxonomic classification in most of the viruses. We also clinically, especially for clinical virology, want to divide them in terms of the organs, in terms of the tissues that they go and infect and cause damage. For example, encephalitis. These are viruses causing damage to the brain cell. Hepatitis. Viruses that go to liver and destroy liver cells. And uh, sometimes we also divide them according to the means of their transmission, how they are uh, how do they reach to their final uh, destination in terms of uh, causing damage? So some of the viruses, they are spread by viruses. We call them arboviruses. Uh, 
and some of the viruses infect animals human mouse birds some viruses infect and they thrive at the expense of the plant cells and we also talked about bacteriophages which are viruses that infect bacteria and uh, as I said earlier viruses have this liking tropism that they will go and look for attachment to those vertical cells of the bodies for example if you want to go and attach to adenoids we call them adenovirus if they want to go to attach to enterocytes intestinal cells we call enterovirus this is a good slide from your book and you can see the basic theme the green DNA or RNA and it has a structural protein and then the structural pro proteins within themselves may have a, a nuclear capsid. So that structural protein is kind of a nuclear capsid and this nuclear capsid uh, may or may not have depending upon which viruses are we talking about have some enzymes and some uh, nucleic acid. Nucleic acids are there within that nuclear capsid and they may have some binding proteins. So DNA or RNA, or RNA plus all those structural proteins they form a nucleocapsid and if it's not enveloped we call it naked capsid virus. But nucleocaps nucleocapsid itself if it is covered with a glycoprotein and a membrane, we call it enveloped viruses. So the difference between naked capsid virus and enveloped virus is that the outermost portion for the enveloped virus is a cell-derived uh, bilipid membrane where you, there are glycoproteins, and this is called a virus. And if you look at the classification we have in terms of the consequences uh, that you may have especially let's talk about for example naked virus a naked virus has a, a a component which is a protein the major component and this naked virus is stable in dry and acidic environment and it can easily spread from hand to hand by dust by small drops as compared to enveloped virus which has a membrane composed of either or lipids, proteins, glycoproteins. And the properties of this particular virus is that the membrane maintain only in aqueous solution and they have to spread in larger droplet, uh, droplets or they are secreted and then uh, they have to be in blood. And many a time the enveloped viruses would not be able to withstand the acidic conditions or the changes in temperatures or changes in pH because the envelope will melt, melt like an ice cream if you leave an ice cream on the table. So this is the classification that we will use in this lecture. Okay, so size does matter. We already talked about differences in sizes and I just picked up uh, this slide to show you that they're all school girls of the same age in the same class but one of their colleagues happens to be small so this is a Guinness Book of World Record for the shortest person and you can see her sitting next to her telephone how much short she is and then again she holds the uh, the shortest person record according to Guinness Book of World Records. So size, the idea is the size does matter. I'm gonna be sure that uh, if your size is small, you can kind of squeeze through quite a few places or get noticed as a matter of fact. Again, uh, I want you to look at the theme that we have. On the left hand side, human DNA viruses. On the right hand side, human RNA viruses. And compare that to a typical bacteria, which is Escherichia coli, about like six micrometer long. And then you can see we have some very small viruses and some medium viruses and some larger viruses. So the smallest of the human DNA viruses is a parvovirus. The smallest of human RNA viruses is Picornavirus. 
and then we have uh, herpes viruses and larger viruses. You can see pox viruses, large viruses, and like pox viruses are too big to even fit in the nucleus. And chlamydia, not a virus, but you can see the size, 0 0.45 micrometers. We did talk about that it's going to pass through the filters. Bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. And the other important thing you have to keep in mind that most of them, either DNA or RNA, they can, they, they should, they have the ability to replicate their genome. And uh, especially for DNA, you can see they do not have lipoproteins as compared to the one on the right. For example, orthomyxovirus, uh, these are exceptions. And also retrovirus, which would not be able to replicate the genome. Most of the RNA viruses are either spherical, icosahedral, or cylindrical or helical. So these are some of the properties that these viruses have. Again, I would want you to pay attention to the size of a typical bacteria to a size of virus. And also keep in mind the idea when I said the viruses infect and go into bacteria like bacteriophage. Uh, we've been talking about retrovirus and uh, retrovirus are special because there's a difference as to how they synthesize their messenger RNA. What normally happens in retroviruses is that they have an ability to utilize a viral reverse transcriptase to form DNA and then host cell DNA dependent RNA polymerase to make their messenger RNA. So this makes the retrovirus very special. I repeat, they have an ability to utilize a viral retro uh, reverse transcriptase, RT stands for reverse transcriptase, uh, to form DNA and then host cell DNA dependent RNA polymerase to make their messenger RNA. The other question is, uh, what is reverse transcriptase? And then Many a time is asked which DNA virus uses a reverse transcriptase to replicate its genome. So the HIV was RNA virus. And the other question is, is there any DNA virus that may use a reverse transcriptase to replicate its genome? The answer is yes, there's HBV hepatitis B virus. That's a DNA virus that also uses the same principle. Now, as I said earlier, uh, the figure shows you the complete virus particle called virion, which consists of nucleic acid genome and is packaged into a protein code capsid or a membrane capsid. So I want you to look at the structure on the left side with the structure of a naked capsid and the enveloped viruses with an acosahedral uh, on the left hand side nucleocapsid or helical right nucleocapsid. The helical ribonucleocapsid is formed by a viral protein associated with RNA genome. So that's a typical structure and you can see uh, the genome hidden and filling and very and very well, very well from the covered one. You will also see that it has different structure element. It has a glycal protein. There are some structure protein. And again, as I said earlier, since enveloped is derived from the host cell and most like human host cells, they have the outermost lipid bilayer. So that lipid bilayer is basically coming from the host cell. So we talked about a lipoprotein envelope and as I just said obtained from cell membrane uh, except herpes virus because that's an exception and the reason is why because it, it circulates in the body without recognition of immune system. That's the whole idea for lipoprotein virus. And the most of the viruses, I would say, uh, have glycoprotein sticky stamps. I'll give an example for this one. And once you have a enveloped viruses, that makes them very sensitive to acid, heat, and detergents. And that's, again, pretty much true of uh, most of the viruses that we see. Otherwise, if you look at, uh, for example, fecal oral viruses, they don't, they are not enveloped because this, I give an example like a postcard. So you can, if you want to communicate with someone, you can either send a postcard. There is no outer covering an envelope as compared to the envelope. You have a letter and that is covered by the envelope. So that's an idea 
I'm giving you in terms of differentiation between most of the fecal oral viruses that are the similitude of a postcard without an envelope. We talked about viral capsid, uh, protein codes are only the genomic material that is formed by repeating subunits. And if you looked at the capsomere, which is a component of the capsid that fit together to compose the larger unit, or it's a building plot of capsid, of capsid made of identical protein subunits. So that's a beautiful outer layer, very structure, homogeneous, symmetrical kind of a thing. So why do have viral, why do viruses have capsid? And what's the advantage? What's the function for that? Number one, it's like a scaffolding, like a structural part which will promote viral assembly. It will protect the genetic material. It will have those glycoproteins, those uh, attachment molecules which will give, which will facilitate these viruses to attach to respective membranes and fuse into cell membranes. And they can then, once they get in contact with that, they can deliver the genome to the correct cell location. Let's talk of naked capsid. As we said earlier, a protein. And uh, what properties would this give to a virus? It doesn't have, since it doesn't have the envelope, the outer envelope, it just had the protein capsid. And uh, naked in a sense without, just like a postcard example I gave earlier, it's very stable uh, in temperature, acid, proteases, detergents, and drying. So these are usually true for fecal oral viruses like rotavirus. And they are released by cell lysis. But also keep in mind the exceptions do exist. We teach you one thing for most of the viruses, but also make a note of it that exception uh, may exist. Now, so if naked capsid had, uh, had this stability with temperature and heat and so on and so forth, then the consequences of that function will be that they can be spread easily on fomites from hand to hand, via dust, by small droplets. They can even dry out and retain infectivity. They can survive the adverse condition of the cut. That's why I said example for the fecal oral viruses. They can be resistant to detergents and poor sewage treatment. And finally, you have to keep in mind the antibody may be sufficient for immunoprotection. And again, on the safety note, note again, exceptions do exist. I did give you an example earlier because we are using these terms alternatively, uh, virus and virion. So virion is a complete virus particle. It has the nucleocapsid plus an envelope for enveloped viruses, or just the nucleocapsid for non enveloped viruses. So, this means that if it has to be a naked virus, it is the genome plus nucleocapsid. If it is an enveloped virus, it is a nucleocapsid plus the envelope. So, that will be called a complete virion. So, what is the structure of a virion especially the enveloped one. It has a outer membrane. It may have lipids, protein, and glycoproteins. It, of course, because of these properties, it has, as I said earlier, especially for the enveloped viruses, they are not stable. So they are labile. They can be easily disrupted by acids, detergent, detergents, drying, and heating because all these agents will modify cell membrane and they are released by budding and cell lysis as compared to the previous one, especially the naked one that just led to cell lysis. The consequences of these physical properties that these uh, enveloped viruses have, they have to stay wet. They cannot survive in gastrointestinal tract. They have to spread in large droplets, secretions, or they go in organ transplantations or blood transfusion. And they do not need to kill the cell to spread, so they can just laterally move into the cell, spread out. They basically need both antibody and cell mediated immune system for protection and control. They have the capability to elicit hypersensitivity and inflammation to cause immunopathogenesis. 
and finally uh, let's talk about uh, the steps in viral replication because if we understand that we will be able to understand how, how do the antiviral drugs uh, act and what is an antiviral therapy so these steps in viral replication are important and why do we need to know them because we need to block them we want to come up with antiviral drugs so two two phases an early phase and late phase the number one thing is that virus when it gets into the system it has to recognize the target cell it will look around and find out what is the target cell uh, for its liking and then when it once it finds the target cell it will attach to it and once it attached to it it wants to penetrate the plasma membrane when it penetrates the plasma membrane it's going to take the coat off and release its DNA or RNA genome into the cell and then again it's going to utilize the host cell machinery to prepare macromolecular synthesis for its own cell so all these components of viruses will be formed within the cell and then it will try to assemble the components of viruses the virus will be assembled and structurally completed and then bud out and once it buds out it's going to pick up the outermost covering of the cell membrane the bilipid cell membrane and bud out and release the virus now two and three especially attachment and penetration uh, rely on viral capsid that again the outermost protein covering that's like something that we really have to have in order for this uh, attachment phase or penetration phase for the plasma membrane and this steps of viral replication will be a slide that I'm going to talk about over and over again I want you to keep in mind uh, all the time there will be slight modification and slight differences for different types of viruses so let's take an example of this one so I want you to pay attention at number one on the top which is a recognition so a virus enters the body it is going to recognize the cell it is going to bind to and we can have a go at this first step so we can have an antibody receptor antagonist that will work on stopping the virus from recognition and stopping the virus from attaching to those recognized uh, cells of virus liking and then let's say we fail so it will attach to it and will penetrate into the cell and then again it will form an endosome and you can see a typically an endosome phagocytosis and then it will want to take this out and uh, uncoat number four and again we have sets of drugs a mantidine kind of a drug typical example that will stop the virus from uncoating let's say we fail then the next step will be that messenger RNA will be formed and the message will be transcribed uh, by a transcription to initiate protein synthesis and you can see that we have some of the drugs that will act on transcription like interferons, antisense, anti oligomers if we fail in that step we can even stop protein synthesis we can use interferon and then even if we fail on that one and then we can still go for metabolic blockers like nucleoside analogs or other drugs that can stop protein synthesis and then finally uh, we can also uh, stop the assembly of viruses by using protease inhibitors and protease inhibitors especially a cocktail of protease inhibitors are used in HIV infections to treat retroviruses and then finally you can see number nine is that we can try and stop the budding and release of these viruses into the circulation and infecting other viruses so this is like a team internal uh, concept of the viral replication like bacteria we wanted to stop that so we have more choices in this one eight nine different levels of action we can go and stop the virus uh, penetrating the cell so you can see especially for one and two uh, we talked about the receptors which are there on the host cell so the structure on the surface of the virus capsid 
to receptors on the cell determines which cells can be infected by a virus. So that's what is a recognition. The examples are, for example, HIV, Epstein-Barr virus, and rabies virus. And this is a good table for you to look. For example, HIV is going to look at helper T cell. Helper T cell is a target T cell, and the receptor that it is looking for is CD4 receptor. For Epstein-Barr virus, the target cell is B cell. It's looking for a CR2, a complement receptor. And rabies, uh, its target is neuron. It's looking at the acetylcholine receptors. So you can see the whole cell receptors which are there. As far as macromolecular synthesis is concerned, as we said earlier, uh, it is going to totally rely on the host cell to make this room for us to make macromolecular synthesis. So early messenger RNA and non-structural protein synthesis. There are genes for enzymes and nucleic acid binding proteins and they will cause the replication of genome and then we have late messenger RNA and structural protein which will cause the post-translation modification of protein. So keep in mind that all these steps which are there in terms of uh, number one messenger RNA production, early protein synthesis, genome and late proteins which basically are structural proteins. So all these kind of get together and uh, make the components, we call them macromolecular synthesis within the cell and again we need to block them. The next question we may ask that why are certain viral genome types infectious while others are not? Well the answer is most of the positive sense RNA viruses and DNA except pox which replicates in cytoplasm and hepatitis B virus which has partially uh, single-stranded genome are infectious and the reason is because their genome can synthesize all required viral proteins directly with host enzymes so that's an advantage and that's how they are more infectious than other some of the slides a uh, very good slide it will give you the structure part when we say I just said what are the steps of viral protein synthesis so I want you to pay attention in this table so you can see different viruses on the left hand side polyoma for example and we have uh, picorna and we have retroviruses each one of them has a different structural element it could be a single or double stranded linear or circular or segmental genome and you can see from here especially retrovirus has a segmental gene genome and then some of them have circular one and all of these have a template when it kind of translates into viral genome reproduction a positive sense DNA or positive uh, DNA or positive sense RNA negative some RNA and then the protein synthesis some of some of the basic ideas we have to have and uh, on the top you can look at the single cycle growth work of a virus once it's released on cell lysis the different stages are defined by the presence or absence of visible viral components uh, which is called eclipse period and then again infectious virus in the media latent period or macromolecular synthesis which is called early and late phases so these are the phases the virus production goes through and then finally we have a growth curve at the lower bottom and uh, graph which has a growth curve and the burst size of representative viruses that how do they produce in terms of uh, over times in terms of hours when they become infectious and finally um, you can look at typically the same mechanism attachment penetrations and so on and so forth for some other viruses give you an example and uh, properties of DNA viruses so I want you to compare both I would rather want you to make a, a table it, and look at the differences between DNA and RNA viruses. DNA viruses, DNA is not transient or labile. Many DNA viruses establish persistent infections. They have this capability of being latent and immortalizing. DNA genomes reside within the nucleus except for the pox viruses, as I said, that keep in mind exceptions are there. Viral DNA resembles host DNA for transcription replication. 
and then finally viral genes must react or interact with the host transcription machine machinery again there's an exception for the pox virus the pox virus has two two exceptions over here if you compare that with an rna virus rna is a labile and transient most rna viruses replicate in cytoplasm cells cannot replicate rna rna viruses must encode an rna dependent rna polymerase the genomes the genome structure determines the mechanism of transcription replication RNA viruses are prone to mutation, very, very important. RNA viruses are prone to mutation. The genome structure and polarity determines how viral messenger RNA is generated and proteins are processed. As we discussed earlier, RNA viruses except positive RNA genome must carry polymerases. They have their own polymerase. And again, very important uh, things to remember, all negative RNA viruses are enveloped. I'm going to give you a mnemonic so that you remember for good. All DNA viruses are double-stranded except parvovirus. All DNA viruses have linear DNA except Papova virus. The double-stranded are circular and HEPA DNA viruses are double-stranded, are either double-stranded, circular or segmental. And then finally, all RNA viruses are, have single-stranded RNA, uh, SS stand for single strand, except Rio virus. Rio virus has a double-stranded and circular RNA. And uh, I think it's pretty much uh, the case for the basic classification that I'm going to use for this part of virology. DNA viruses and RNA viruses. And uh, this was the first lecture the basis of uh, viruses, the structural basis, and uh, as we move along, you will see quite a few similarities. So I would want you to at least go over the basic properties of viruses and what properties uh, are confirmed uh, and conferred in terms of the uh, ability of these viruses to be infectious and not infectious. And then also I would want you to pay attention to the steps in viral replication so that we can understand how are we going to use antiviral therapy. All right. Thank you.